Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for the next hour of Good Gardening. Our program is all about answering your gardening questions, so give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. We take emails and pictures for future show, and that address is byf at unl.edu. Please attach those pictures as JPEGs. Do not forget to tell us where you live. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media offerings. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So let's look at samples. I don't see any insects on that one, Wayne. You're I'm not just not looking. You're not looking close enough. <laughs> All right. What All do we right. have? Tonight, I brought some pine needle scale that are, interestingly enough, on a blue spruce. Pine needle scale hits a lot of our conifers. <coughs> they hit um, there are these little white scale looking uh, critters on here. They can be confused with bird droppings if you're not looking real close. Uh, this particular one I had to look real hard to, on the tree to find it so it's not a real heavy infestation. A few of these is not going to cause too much of a damage but if they get thick they can start to cause the tree to decline at least in how it looks. It loses these needles and when you do need to deal with them, you're gonna to need to either time it for when the crawlers are out, because when they have that white scale on top of them, it's very difficult to get a topical insecticide onto them. However, a, and it's systemic works very well, and systemics containing acephate work very well. So ACE, PH, FATE. Excellent. Acephate Good. works really well for these, so find that product labeled for your conifer trees. Excellent. And <clears throat> Sharpen your eyesight. Yes. <laughs> Although when it's a thick infestation, you can't miss them. All right. All right, Bill, you're making just one mess on the table here. I'm so scientist. Oh. I like you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, some sod that um, came from my backyard. I just sod it a week ago. And I wanted to talk a little bit, not about the green, but the underside and all of those beautiful brand new roots that this plant has made in a week. Mm -hmm. So I really want to talk about watering sack because I think there's a lot of misconceptions there about how long we have to water. So what you want to do is you put sod down and there's no roots under here, lay it down and then water really heavy. And the goal on that first water is to get the soil underneath nice and wet. But fortunately it's not going to dry out because that's, it's got sod on top of it. So then we want to just water like once or twice a day just to keep the sod wet. You don't want to water too heavily. And then once these start, roots start to peg in, which is in you know, a matter of days, we can stop watering because now the sod is going to start pulling the water from the soil. So you don't have to be watering like you know, four times a day for four weeks with sod. Uh, get it in and then when, when you're doing your watering in the morning, you know, go to the corner, try to pull it up, and then if you see some of these roots starting to peg down into that soil, that's when uh, you can start to reduce watering and uh, that sod will be fine. So, you know, don't overwater the sod. Once you can't pull up anymore, you're good to go when it comes to establishing it. Excellent. Very good. I don't know what you're going to do with the soil on the table, but... You know, I'm just going to roll around in it the rest of the show. It'll be fun. <laughs> right. Great sample. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Ugliness. Well, not really. It, <laughs> ugliness is in the eye of the beholder, right? It's whether or not it is. So Jeff's going to do a section on cleaning up roses, and this is an example of some things that you may see in your roses that are growing out uh, that are some of our rose viruses. So we have a lot of different... Uh, infections that can happen with roses that are viruses. Uh, this is an example here, you can kind of see, it. you may think this looks normal, but if you look close at this one, you can see there's a lot of spines on this, and they're real soft, so you can just, it looks like it would be really pokey, but you can just take that and squeeze it, and those uh, thorns are just really, really uh, soft and in high number. The other one would be this one, where you can kind of see some of the leaves are yellow and twisting. Um, so in that situation, both of these are examples. Here's a leaf that's kind of stringing and, you know, uh, you know, leaf strapping, we refer to that as. So when you see these types of symptoms, um, you're, you're dealing with a virus that you really can't do anything about except to rogue the plant out. Now, if you have uh, one rose bush in your landscape and you have this problem and, and you enjoy that rose bush, you can leave it there. It's not going to do anything to it. It will decline over time and it will die. But if you bring in new, ro new rose bushes, you're going to spread that to them. So uh, it just kind of depends on your situation. So 
I, I leave them in my yard because I enjoy looking at them this way and don't bring new roses in. <laughs> and it gives you a sample to bring to yes, us. And it's easy to go out in the yard and get a sample. <laughs> All right, thanks, Lauren. All right, Elizabeth, some shrubs and trees tonight. Some shrubs and trees, and we got some reliable bloomers, the one here in the <coughs> front. Um, what that is is a spring snow wagelia. And why we're highlighting that one is because it's an underutilized shrub. It is really a reliable bloomer. It always blooms late April, early May. Totally hardy, can handle the, that partial shade environment, um, has a nice rounded form to it, usually around six by six in terms of size. But it's one of those that I was reading on the internet is, is an underutilized one and it's one that we often don't think of. Um, the other one that's up here that's a little bit different is the Amur choke cherry, and it's not really a choke cherry, um, but it's a really cool tree. What it has is it has these long racemes of flowers, and the cool part about this tree is the bark. The bark is super glossy and it kind of peels and it's a really awesome bark to take a look at. Um, some people call it a cinnamon color, um, if that gives you an idea, kind of that orangish color. Single stem, non-suckering. Um, it doesn't produce much fruit in those um, partial shade environments. And then the last one down here is a tried and true. What it is, is this is a current. And why I like currants is because out at Fauner Park in Grand Island, the rabbits do not eat the clove currant that is out there, which is one of the very few things out there that the rabbits do not eat. Um, but it's, it's flowering right now. It's gonna set some fruit. The, the fruit are edible. Um, they're a little tart. Um, is a nice way to say that. So um, you can let the birds go ahead and eat them. But we've got three really nice spring blooming shrubs and a tree in here. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. All in the backyard farmer garden. All, there you go. <laughs> All right, you have a Wahoo viewer, Wayne, who has a sunset maple that was otherwise healthy, not leafing out. He thinks it has oyster shell scale. Wondered if he should use a particular systemic on it. High value, he does want to save the tree and he has a silver maple and a willow with what he thinks is the same scale. So there's the big tree and then I think we have a close up of, of the uh, Oyster shell. Oh yes, lovely oh, yeah. oyster shell scale. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just like the pine needle scale that I had that I brought in, mm -hmm. you want to catch these in the crawler stage before they form that waxy shell over them and then they're protected if you're going to go about that way. If you go with the systemic, that's the fun thing. I get to repeat, acephate works really well. And mm -hmm. the thing about maples is they bloom early. So now once they're done blooming, you could get that applied on and you're not going to affect our pollinators. Okay. So that's one plus about the timing with this particular tree species. All right, excellent. And apparently it likes way more than one species of oh, tree. Oh, oyster oh. shell scale is a nasty, nasty, nasty little it's critter. It's a nasty one. <laughs> Good. All right, Bill, uh, you have a couple of turf questions from a couple of different people, and they're all dead spots. Okay. And they look like this, and one person thought maybe it was dog spots and another put down fertilizer in 2,4-D and pre-merge, not near the driveway. They don't put salt down. One's south of Decatur. So yeah, what do we think here? I mean, it could be a lot of things. It could be dog spots. Um, even if you, you're watering after your dog uses the restroom, I guess, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's preventing the, that spot from forming. Uh, one of those looks like it could be some warm season perennials, things like windmill grass or nimble weed, nimble will. Um, these are uh, grasses that would green up a little bit later, and so that could be um, why it would disappear later on. Um, if it's just dead from maybe some salt in the winter or from dog spots, we can seed right now. We're still in that window, so we can go out, rough the area up, put some seed down. Um, don't need to put too much mulch, just to maybe a little bit of a, of a, a paper-based mulch is usually good. It doesn't have any, any weed seed. Um, if it is a nimble will or a windmill grass, then um, when that grass greens up, you could hire a professional and they could come out and spray something like Mesotrione, Tenacity, um, or Pilex, or you could use a non-selective herbicide to try to kill it, but that would happen once the grass has kind of resumed normal uh, green growth. So um, we'll have to be a little bit patient there to figure out what exactly that is. Right now it looks just like dead leaves, so it's a little difficult, <coughs> but um, uh, if it is like a, an issue, you know, seeding right now is a good idea. All right, thank you, Bill. 
This is a viewer, uh, Lauren, along the Niagara River in north central Nebraska. They've grown onions without any problems, <clears throat> and then they're able to store them. Last two years, they come up semi-rotten. So what is this all about? Well, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to diagnose this and I'm going to ask if, is, if Elizabeth has any comments on this, but I believe that this is like, this is a slippery skin disorder, which would be a bacterial infection and it would result in a soft rot. Uh, it many times would have that discolor inside. I can kind of see some yellow tinning to it, which the bacterium that causes it will have a bacterial mm. yellow tint to it. Uh, so I believe that's what it is. Uh, really storage wise, if you can keep them cooler, that's going to help. Uh, but they're going to continue to soft rot. It's going to exist there as long, and when they're warmer, they're going to soft rot more rapidly. So I think cool temperature is what I would do. I concur. Anything else? Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, and it's going to be in the soil, so unless they want to yeah. rotate, and it's really difficult to get rid of, but just trying to make sure you're not injuring those bulbs when you're harvesting in any way and drying them out is the best thing you can do. Well, and they initially. did say they've been growing them for eight years. So, so they know what they're doing. They move. could rotate maybe. Right. Okay. Try another spot. Good, thanks, Lauren. All right, so this is a, an Omaha viewer, Elizabeth. Um, she thinks the mugo pine is ready to say, <laughs> time to bite the dust. What do we think here? It's been five years, so interesting that it would be five years before it gave up the ghost. In this instance, I would say it doesn't have much landscape value to it left, um, that now would be an excellent <coughs> opportunity to go ahead and take it out or rogue it out, as Lauren would say, um, and go ahead and try something else in there. Mugo pine are susceptible to pine wilt, and so um, it could be a combination of things going on in there, but like I said, I would just kind of uh, take this opportunity to try something else in that spot. All right, excellent, thank you. And then we also had a split in a maple tree. So what do we think about that? This is a carny viewer. Anything so, they can do, it's about 20 years old. With that maple tree, it's just gonna be a wait and see kind of a deal. We wanna leave that open to the environment. We want it to be able to breathe. We don't wanna put paint or tar or anything on it. I would probably suspect later on down the season or down the road, they might notice that limb that's directly above that split could start to fail with time. I'd be interested to see if that tree puts on callus tissue or you know that swollen tissue to kind of try to help seal over that wound. Um, it's just kind of odd for a tree of that size to all of a sudden have a big crack in it. And so I did notice it had some stem girdling roots on there too, but I'd also be interested if there's other things going on in that environment that caused that crack all of a sudden. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Lightning strike will sometimes make a line like that <coughs> in the tree, so. That's true. It's possible. That's true, and it ever It'll put a straight line right down like twice. that. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> I think it wasn't lightning, Lauren. Okay. <laughs> lightning round. <laughs> yeah. You know, we like traditional colors and the forms that roses give us, but this time of year, you're really going to have to do a little cleanup if you want them to shine later in the season. Let's hear from Jeff Culbertson about spring pruning and cleanup for those roses. Every spring, we get a lot of questions about what to do with our roses, how are we going to prune them, how are we going to care for them as we go through the year. So we're going to go through some of the basic steps to help make sure your roses are successful for you this year. So you go out there, right now is really the time we want to go out and start cutting back our roses, getting the dead out of these plants and doing some cleanup and getting us prepared for the rest of the year. The first thing that we're going to want to do is come in and do some sanitation. You can see here, we've got some leaves from last year that are at the base of these plants. We're going to want to clean all this up. In fact, I'll probably want to rake out some of this mulch. And um, then before I put down a new layer of mulch, I'll get a balanced fertilizer, you know, kind of a typical garden fertilizer, a 10-10-10, something like that. Sprinkle about a cup or so around the plant, about six inches away from the base of the plant, but evenly spread that around the plant. And then I'll put down a new layer of mulch. So that'll get us off to a good start. We'll sanitize the area. And that will help prevent some of those things that uh, may concern us, like black spot, uh, powdery mildew, some of those things that may carry on through the rest of the year. The next thing that we'll do is go in and start evaluating what we want to do with some pruning. And you can see with this plant, 
we have a lot of debt in it, a lot of dieback, and so we're gonna wanna come in and cut these back. And so what I usually look for is the, oh, I'll probably drop down to the second good bud, outside bud on a cane, and then I'll cut about a quarter inch above that at a 45 degree angle. And so that will help remove any of that if we have a canker or anything else going on, get that all off of that that cane and we're down to some good wood. And then as it grows, that bud will then grow outward. And so that'll help with some of our air circulation, help prevent some of those diseases that we may get through the year. So roses like to have even moisture. Um, so one of the things we wanna look at with irrigation is try to avoid overhead irrigation. I know we hear that a lot on the show, and certainly with roses, that's one of those. So if you have some sort of drip hose or you water at the base of the plants, again, that just kind of helps eliminate some of that moisture that we're adding to it beyond the rain and the dew and stuff that the, the roses have to deal with through the year. And then as we go through the year, just kind of keep an eye on it. If you're close to, like we are here close to a sidewalk, we're gonna make sure that we don't have canes encroaching onto the sidewalk so people are snagging on that or within your landscape where you're mowing or where you're working around that, make sure that you do some of that, keep, keep things pruned back. Uh, as you can see here, I'm wearing leather gloves. That's always something to think about, a heavier pair of gloves while you're working around roses. I make sure my pruners are nice and sharp so I have nice clean cuts and we wanna use a bypass pruner. We don't wanna use an anvil type pruner so we don't wanna crush those stems. So make sure your pruners are sharp and clean and ready to go. You should be off to a good start with your roses this year. So just a little bit of attention for your roses this spring will really go a long way later on when it's time for them to put on that show. And don't forget to rake out the old mulch and the dead material from last year that might be harboring all those problems you don't want to have to deal with. Good advice. And all keep right. that virus infected one if you just have one. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> As you said. Yeah. All right, so this is really cool. You have a couple of grub pictures. The first one is actually from the Rio Grande Valley in South yep. Texas, and that is a quarter, if people want to know how big that yep. thing is. What is it? Well, you go to the right place in Nebraska, you can find this too. Really? This looks like green June beetle oh. larva. They are large. This is probably a fully mature one. Mm -hmm. And you manage them about like you do regular white grubs. All right, so just a big juicy morsel if you're a bird. And your second one I think is, um, this is a Lincoln viewer and found that particular grub while they were preparing their raised garden beds. Sure. So they're wondering, she figures there's more in there. What should she do before she plants? Well, I guess I would wanna know what she's putting in there. Well, <laughs> let's see, she says zucchini, cucumber, and Swiss chards. You probably don't wanna to do too much because you don't want it getting up into the plant, you don't want it getting into the flowers because most of our grub control, um, we're not gonna, we don't want that to happen if we're gonna use some of like the imidacloprid based products, which are more of a preventative. If you go with the other ones, they're not as effective, you'll have to incorporate. Probably the better thing to do is just wait and see if you have more than that as you go through there or just mix it up real good as you go through. Since it's a raised bed, we're not as worried about tearing up the soil and the structure. So we'll go ahead and tear it up, pick out what you can and then uh, from there, um, just watch them as you go. And if you start to get a lot of wilt that you can't explain because you're watering, you might have some root pruning issues from them. Okay, use a fork, stab, <laughs> right? And chew. No, no, no. no. <laughs> we saw some made, uh, June beetles uh, on greens and they're huge. Yeah. They're, they're out already, it's great in some spots, but. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, nice to mm -hmm. know. Okay, Bill, you now have another different sort of a turf problem. Yep. And this one is large yellow areas. We have a couple in Lincoln, and then we have a couple that are actually a Sioux City, Iowa viewer. Um, they were told it was an iron problem. It would go away after the temps came up. Do they have to do something? So there's your two sets of yeah, yellow there. This could be so many things, it's impossible <laughs> to say. Um, Iron, I'm not too worried about. We generally see that when the soils are warm and wet, and so when the grass isn't slow growing, it's not usually a deficiency issue with iron. But it makes me think about some of our grassy weeds like rough bluegrass, it could be annual ryegrass, it could just be another cultivar of bluegrass that's greening up faster than the other. Um, I scalped my backyard on accident last week, and the areas that got scalped 
grew back more in that yellow color and a little bit faster. So if you think it's a different grass, when you send these pictures in with your location, if you can please <laughs> take a nice clear picture of where the leaf is coming off of the main stem, that can help us identify what grass that actually is. So if you can send one you know, big picture and one real close picture, nice and clear, then we can identify some of the structures and I can give you a better diagnosis. Otherwise, just send a sample in and, and we can figure it out that way too. All right, excellent, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is way cool, Lauren, <clears throat> and interesting. This is a viewer who had a branch break off his pin oak last year, and so he inoculated it with shiitake mus mushroom mycelium, which are those white spots. He was hoping to get mushrooms, but then he sees these fabulous red things coming out of the log, like that, wondering what that is and will it prevent the shiitakes from <laughs> gracing his table. You are saying he, so I can say, brother, a, I, I, feel, he. I feel your pain, brother, because <laughs> I have worn out or burnt up drills trying to grow mushrooms on logs that I didn't sterilize or Ooh. do anything to kill the native fungi that are already existing there, which is what the red structures are coming out. Those are fruiting structures from another fungus that is not your shiitake mushroom. Uh, inoculation or your inoculum that you placed in there in the wood peg. So unfortunately, you probably have so much colonization with that that you may not see any mushrooms develop. You can watch and, and just see what happens over time. But if you try this again, the best thing you can do is try to get fresh wood and, and dry that wood out. Or if you can do something to, to steam it or, or get it warm enough to kill those native fungi. And then when you introduce your other inoculum and that fungus will colonize that log and then you have a better chance of, of that. So uh, it, those kits are sold. It's, it sounds easy that you would just go drill these in and, and have mushrooms and everything would be wonderful, but there's a lot more to it than that. Hmm. So, yeah. But, but anyway. those, oh, those orange ones are pretty. Yeah, those are pretty too. So I mean, you just enjoy <laughs> that and just that's don't great, eat. yeah. Go to the mushroom, go to the, go to the grocery, get some shiitake mushrooms, come back and enjoy the little red. <laughs> I'm not sure what they are. There's some sort of a <laughs> Canadian four of a different fungus. All right, thanks, Lauren. <laughs> all right, uh, this is this is also a, a tree question. This is an Ashland viewer. Pictures of the crab apple tree, the damage, which I'm sure he's talking about here, is the splitting in the trunk, happened over the winter. So seeing a lot of this this year, I think Elizabeth, what's the prognosis and anything they should do? You know, it's going to be similar to the other one. We're just going to leave it open to the environment, and it's just going to be a waiting game. A lot of these trees, they set their buds <clears throat> last year, and so they're going to bloom normal. They're going to leaf out normal. But if they're going to start to fail, it's going to be later on in the season. We might notice them drop leaves earlier than normal, or they might have a heavier than normal fruit set. Uh, when we had the bark blasting in 2014, it took a year or more between before some of those flowering pears really started to decline decline quickly. So it's just going to be a matter of time. It's going to be a wait and see. But again, I think it's going to be another opportunity to try something different in that spot. Which is a very positive way to look at it. I try. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, a little moisture and colder temps this week meant our plants stayed in the greenhouse for longer. We did manage to get a few plants into the ground, though. And here's Terry James to tell us more about the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're slowing it down. We have to remember that it is only the 1st of May and parts of the state has up to seven inches of snow again. We have our stuff in the greenhouse, it's happy, lucky, and eventually we'll start hardening them off. If you look outside, we have some asparagus coming up. Those warm days actually got, got some of it starting to kind of bolt. So we do have a little bit of ferns in there, but we do need to go in and cut that back. We have some of our greens coming up, some of our peas coming up. So some things are greening up outdoors. Remember though, we are slowing it down because our last frost date here in Lincoln wasn't until April 27th and it is May 12th for Western Nebraska. So don't hurry outside. Just come on down to the backyard farmer garden and see what we're doing. So plants are still a little on hold for now, but soon we will be digging and planting and on our way to a really another great season in the garden. And we are a little delayed, but farmers markets had some pretty good fresh stuff this weekend. So, all right, regular old questions, Wayne, Japanese beetles. 
This viewer had them on hybrid tea roses, hand picks them off and puts them in soapy water. Anything else they can do to reduce them or do other times of the year before she actually sees them? Well, there's nothing you can really do so much before you see the Japanese beetles. Uh, if there's another plant you want to sacrifice or a neighbor you particularly don't like, you can buy one of those pheromone traps and go set it underneath that other plant or in your neighbor's yard and they will all be attracted to that. <laughs> now, don't. Don't do <laughs> yeah. the ladder uh, unless you have permission from your neighbor to, you know, if they have an open front yard, there's mm -hmm. no landscaping, that might be a great place to set that trap. Just be prepared. If you're in a heavy infested area, you can fill those bags in a day. Some of the further places back east, they can do that. And they're even talking about composting those Japanese beetles that they're catching hmm. for something to do with them. But hand picking is, if you're not looking at using an insecticide of any kind, is probably your best bet. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, this is a Plattsmouth flooding question, Bill. Uh, this viewer, they're expecting water <laughs> rationing to go into October. Mm -hmm. Has a tall fescue lawn, no outside watering will be allowed. So what are we saying for managing, fertilizing, those kinds of things if no supplemental water is going to be allowed? Sure, so from a fertilizing with a tall fescue lawn, you're probably looking at maybe one or two applications a year is really what's all that's really needed. Uh, if you over fertilize, this can be a little bit more succulent, meaning it needs more water to uh, sustain itself. Um, when you do your fertilizer too, you try to time it around you know, a light rain to try to help water it in. Don't put it right in front of a huge downpour that's gonna wash it away. Um, luckily, tall fescue in our soils can be pretty deep rooted and you don't have to, uh, to water too much. Uh, tall fescue lawns in Lincoln, honestly, might need to get watered a handful of times on a typical summer with our rainfall in eastern Nebraska. So uh, if you see a little bit of wilt, that's um, generally that's going to be okay. Uh, it's only the years when we have like 2012 and then the tall fescue really took it in the shorts because uh, it, you didn't get anything for a whole summer. So in a normal year, we shouldn't really actually lose any tall fescue if you can't water it in eastern Nebraska. All right. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren, this is a Southwest Thayer County viewer uh, in Deschler, actually. He wants to know when to spray the apple trees. He's not really saying for what, but we're assuming it's probably uh, disease more than insects. Well, most likely, and, and really if you're after quality fruit production and, and you really are trying to control your disease and insect problems, I'd really encourage you to look at a fruit tree spray schedule which has a comprehensive guide of everything. You would tend to start that around the pink stage of flowering right when they're starting to, when you're seeing buds, <clears throat> because that's gonna protect your leaves because depending on also not knowing what, what cultivar you have, you could have uh, susceptibility to scab, for example, which would need protection earlier in the season, right when those leaves are starting to come out. So um, difficult to say just in general spray now. Uh, really want to integrate that with what type of apple tree you have, the cultivar, what your main disease problems are, and then targeting those. So I'd recommend looking at a spray schedule guide and then look at specific disease issues if you know the history. All right. If you don't this year, do some identification so next year you can get it right. Perfect. You typically won't see them die, just the quality will be lower. All right. Thank you, Lauren. All right, Elizabeth, this is a Fremont viewer who had a big silver maple cut down last fall and now it's shooting out all sorts of shoots from the base. They want to know what to do about it. It's in sandy soil. It's in sandy soil. So what they could do is if they still left enough of a stump, what they could do is they could go through and remove that bark or at least the outer edge where the cambium layer is. It well, cambium layer is, um, and then you could use um, glyphosate or another type of herbicide to kill that root system. Otherwise, if you're looking at killing the suckers that pop up in the yard, um, we could be using like a 240 broadleaf weed killer. It's probably not going to have a whole lot of effect on the overall root system and you're going to continue to see those. So your best bet is to try to remove that outside cambium layer if that trunk's still there um, and put some product around the outside because that's going to absorb it down into the root system and you're going to get a better kill. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are you ready, Elizabeth? Ready as I'm going to be. Okay. We have a viewer in the Lus Hills over on the Iowa side who wants to know how you, she can get moss roses established. Moss roses, you can get them as annuals or you can even get seeds and they will reestablish themselves. All right. <clears throat> how do you control creeping Charlie around grapes without hurting the grapes? Um, you can continue to pull or you can dab method with a product like Roundup or a glyphosate product. There's other products labeled just for grapes, though. So. All right. Um, 
onions with a thickened neck. This is in Torrington, Wyoming. What causes the thickened neck and then they never actually form a bulb? It could be varietal, it could be the temperature, could just be that it has on a turtleneck. <laughs> This is a viewer in Ravenna, Elizabeth, who wants to know whether hibiscus can be moved now. Not now, um, especially if we're talking the Rose of Sharon. All right, I think they're talking the big plate size. The hibiscus. big ones. Yeah. They haven't come up quite yet, so they might be able to get those transplanted now. Um, it really makes a difference which one we're talking. All right, we have Wagelia mowed off by rabbits. Will it come back? Hopefully. <laughs> a nice job. The last one didn't count. Yeah. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> All right, on that note, Lauren, are you ready? Let's see if I have any samples that I can say they're wearing a turtleneck. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, we had black knot on the show last week, and can black knot cause, cause the tree trunks to actually crack? Hmm. I haven't seen that much. I'm going to say no. All right. There are orange growths appearing on cedars. This is a Sioux City viewer. Cedar apple rust calls. And what can they do about that now? Pluck them off. Use them as an indicator to go hunt morel mushrooms. All right. There are round green rings in this person's turf. They're not solid. What might that be? Fairy ring. And what do they do about the fairy ring? Take the fairy gardens out. <laughs> no points for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do they do? Not, not much to do with that. Just mask it with fertility. Usually you're not going to put a fungicide on it in the home landscape. All right. Will fire blight spread from choke cherry to apple trees? Fire blight, choke cherry to apple trees. Yeah, good. All right. And so what can they do to control the fire blight? Burn it out. <laughs> Burn it out. <laughs> 7 to 11 inches below the affected area. All right. There is a viral disease of tree peonies in Fremont. Do we know what to do about that? Rug it out. <laughs> and you're right on that one. I think he, I got a trophy. He did Look not give eight. them that yeah, one. Got eight. He got a point for answering <laughs> the fairy. Fairy garden one. They like me in the booth. Has seven. Seven all right. for Very nice to the people to in the booth. All right, all right. Trophy. I'll go for nine. It's cool. All right. <laughs> Bill. Yeah. What is the correct mowing height for a fescue lawn? Three inches. Is that correct all over the state or just in the eastern part of the state? It depends on how often you want to mow. You can go lower, you have to mow more. You can go less, you can go higher, you have to mow less high frequently. All right. This is a Loretto, Nebraska viewer who wants to know uh, when to resume mowing after they overseed their lawn. Mow as soon as you can start to hit the leaf because it will actually help that plant turn into an adult. All right. Um, this person wants to seed the warm season grasses as a turf. Is the timing right for that now, or do we wait? You know, we're, you can still seed now. Um, yeah, you can seed now. It's better to seed a little bit earlier in the spring with warm season grasses. Seed now, use something with, um, for weed control like mesotrione. That is a good idea. All right. Um, this Buffer person grass. wants to know whether they can use iron to green up a lawn for a graduation party. You can. You can also use green paint for grass. <laughs> All right. Seriously. There really is green paint for grass. Yeah, I research it. Okay. They're called turf colorants. Really? Yes. You need to get some and bring it in for a sample. I mean, we like green baseball and football fields in the middle in December. Green paint. It's happening. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> That's wrong on so many levels. Is this like the designer tree trunk paint? There's different colors. You can pick the product that has different green color. Okay, your turn, Wayne. <laughs> so, uh, are you ready? Sure. I don't, it's a tough act to follow. Okay. Uh, we've unfortunately had more snow and cold in the northwestern part of the state. Has that killed the pollinators that might have emerged? Well, the, our early season ones are used to f hiding from these types of things. And we got to remember that the soil is warming. And so a lot of these do nest in the ground. So I wouldn't be too concerned about them at this point. All right. Uh, cherries are forming in, and this is the northeast corner of the state. <coughs> is it too late to control the cherry maggots? Oh, we're not even there yet. Okay. That's later when it starts to ripen that we need to be concerned about that. Okay. Um, this person said they had some sort of aphids on their sunflowers last year. What would those have been, and can you control them now? There's some native aphids that will come in on sunflowers. If they're the big red ones, that's what I would think they were. Just a hose blast at all. You need to clean those off. All right. Um, this viewer had early radishes, and how do you control the maggots from getting into them? Maggots? Or something eating them from below. Mag from below. 
that's interesting. Their soil is probably too wet, and that's probably more of a cultural control problem there. All right. Do aphids bother tomato plants? They can. Uh, again, with aphids, hose is a really good option. Okay, um, yeah, that is rats my, and spots. That yeah. is my all-time high. <laughs> well, you know what that means. Do I get a trophy? You get the trophy. I won the trophy? But you have to give it back. Okay, I'll give it back, but I would, I would really like to thank the people in the control booth for being so generous <laughs> in your credit tonight. In other words, thank yours, you very much. The, the deck was stacked in the back. Yep. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, what do we have for Plants of the Week? <laughs> <laughs> we have some very nice plants of the week. Um, what do we have right in front of, we've got this grape hyacinth right here. Um, and the grape hyacinth is one of the early seasons. It's a little tiny bulb that comes up. Um, it's got these really fine foliage to it and then it's followed by these um, really, some people call them grape scented. I can't catch the grape, but it smells, it's fragrant regardless. Um, it's a naturalizer, so it's gonna kinda take over in, in an area and kinda spread itself. And the cool part about this is it'll go summer dormant. So the foliage comes up, and then it blooms, and then it dies back down, and then it comes back up again, and then it can act as kind of an evergreen um, all winter long. The other one, the yellow one, is one that is really cool, uh, variegated yellow archangel. And what it does is it has some of these silvery blotches on the leaf. Uh, it really does well in shade. And so what happens is, is these silver blotches and the yellow really help to brighten up that dark shade, uh, part to full shade. It's in the mint family, so that being said, it can be fairly aggressive. But it is happy underneath spruces in dry shade. So if you're looking for a plant to kind of lighten up that spot, to have something under that area where you really can't grow anything else, um, this yellow archangel is one to try. Pollinators really like it because it is in that mint family too, and it's got a really unique uh, flower to it. Um, and so it's a fun one and uh, pretty cool. I like it. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right. Next pictures are yours, Wayne. Uh, this is one of your master gardeners in Norfolk, That's so you right. actually have the sample to go with the pictures. This is her aronia, and she wonders what in the world is going on. She's got some webbing going right, on so with it too. We'll let the camera guys do their work here. All right, what we have here, this is a that aronia berry. You see those dead leaves all pulled together, and there is some webbing on there that looks like it could be uh, spider mite or something like that, but we're way too early for that. And spider mites don't pull everything in and around it. That's very typical of some kind of moth or butterfly caterpillar that will do that. Uh, as I pulled this one back, I'm not gonna try and tease him out, but there's a little reddish brown caterpillar in here hmm. that's living in the center. Uh, oftentimes when we get this kind of aggregation, my first guess on a type of caterpillar would be one of our leaf rollers. Mm -hmm. uh, they call them tortricid moths. Uh, as I talked to Viola about this, she told me that uh, it kind of shows up first thing in the spring like this and then disappears. Mm -hmm. So at this point, if, well, for her, she thinks they're cool. Kind of fun to watch it happen. Um, you know, lives by Fred's mantra of you know, nature's wondrous pandered tree. And I wouldn't mess with it too much because this has really adhered very well down to the stem. And so to even pull it off, you're, you could be risking damaging part of that stem. So unless you're willing to cut off the whole stem to get rid of it, just, just let, let it, be. it be. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, this is a barnyard grass question, Bill. He thinks that's what it is. He says predominantly around the <coughs> fence lines, um, newly sodded yard last fall in the Bennington area, and he wants to know if he can get rid of it without killing everything else. I know, I'm not really convinced that that's Barnyard grass. Um, so it, it kind of has some characteristics of just even some more forage type tall fescues. Um, if it's tall fescue, unfortunately, then it would be um, you know non-selective type controls. Uh, there's nothing available for a homeowner, anything that's outside of a sod farm for control of tall fescue and cool season. If it gets bigger and you get a positive ID for barnyard grasses, there are a couple different options there, but. Um, well, let's make sure we have the right ID. Um, there's some great keys out there too. You can do it yourself. Just look for those oracles and those ligules and the venation and you can kind of figure that out. And so uh, um, once you have that ID, there's some, some options there for browning your grass, but I'm just not convinced that's what it is right now. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, this is a Pender, Nebraska viewer, Lauren, and found this jelly looking mass, this greenish jelly looking something or other, and we couldn't really 
tell much about it other than it landed in your pathology lab. Yeah, and I, I'm really not sure what that is. If anyone else on the panel sees that and knows what it is, please comment. Um, I tend to think just, and it's hard to zoom in on it, I was thinking more like an algal growth or something in that nature. If it was a really wet spot, um, there are other plant-like organisms it could be, but that one kind of has me stumped with the picture. Okay, so. all right, that happens. Sorry. Elizabeth, you have a couple of what to do about this thing they don't want. The first is uh, a daylily, and she's calling it invasive, wonders to know how to get rid of it. And the second of your pictures is what is coming up in the iris. Will it spread into the lawn, and will weed be gone, kill it? And she will be planting tomato plants just a few uh, feet away from this one. Okay, so in the picture that we currently have up here, what that is, is that is catchweed bed straw. The good thing about catchweed bed straw is it has a very, very, very shallow root system. So what you can do is you can don a cotton glove and move your hand around in there and you'll rip up all that catchweed bed straw. Um, the seeds look like little tiny green BBs and they are Velcro-y just like the leaves are. And so you wanna try to get rid of those. They're a, a winter annual, so they're nearing the end of their <coughs> lifespan. Even if you could spray them, it's not gonna do you a whole lot of good. I'd still take a look in that area. What you probably have in this second picture is the old fashioned orange daylily, right. which those things are super aggressive. Um, so what you could do is you could use a non-selective herbicide, um, glyphosate like Roundup in that area, or you could dig it up and give it to some neighbors or things like that. I know they um, multiply very quickly. And they live in tough spots, so you could do that with it too. I had somebody refer to them as the nuclear bomb plant. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> all right. Well, occasionally we get the odd question that something, an insect or a disease, is attacking their pine or fir because it's covered with little red or bright green structures. Well, as Fred used to say, it is all part of nature's wondrous pageantry and nothing to worry about at all. So our second feature will take a look at conifer cones. In the spring, we get a lot of questions about what is wrong with my pine, my fir, my spruce, and usually nothing, unless of course it was winter damage. What people are referring to is these odd looking, oftentimes bright pink pieces of the plant that look a little bit like candy, or perhaps little brownish things, or tiny, tiny little pointing up pieces of the plant that release pollen. What you're looking at is male and female cones and the buds for current year's growth. So evergreens are not plants that flower. These are gymnosperms, not angiosperms. And so what you're really seeing is a difference between the male cone and the female cone. So enjoy the beautiful pink candy-like structures. Look at the way the cones form. On a pine, the cones are going to appear later in the season, a little later, because they have actually not broken far enough to, to release the pollen yet and form those cones in most instances. On the fir, we rarely, if ever, see cones on fur down low in the plant, and the cones on fur are so unusual because they point straight up. So even within a week's worth of spring appearing, we have cones on this fur down low this year because it was such an interesting year, and you can see them beginning to form. If you were out and about earlier, you might have touched the branch, branch of, a, of a fir and seen the pollen just fly all over the place. Of course, that would be the male cones pollinating the female. So, and we use words like stroboli, which of course sounds a little bit like an Italian dish as opposed to a part of a plant. So you've got pine, you've got fir, and you've got spruce. And the spruce, again, are going to show the brilliant pink candy-like structures. And then the cones will form. And on the spruce in particular, what you will see is the brownish tips or the brownish ends unless it is truly the needles that are, that are brown, what you're seeing is the buds for the next year's growth. So again, nothing to worry about. These are not rots or spots. These are actually a part of the beauty of the way that these evergreens, these conifers, grow. To complicate matters further, we use words like evergreen for pine, spruce, and fir. They're conifers, and so is this, and so is bald cypress. 
And these are actually deciduous conifers as opposed to evergreens because of course evergreens, even though they do shed their needles, they do not lose them all at once or else they're a former evergreen. So this is a larch and what you're seeing again is the cones, the males have already released their pollen and these beautiful little tufts are actually the new needles. This has already pushed its needles. Bald cypress will show interesting what appears to be flowers on the very top of the tree. And of course what that is is the males releasing their pollen and then the cones on bald cypress will occur in clusters of what looks like green soccer balls. So very unusual, very different part of the conifer world would be these deciduous conifers, which do tend to look a little bit like dead evergreens in the winter. Make sure you know that they're not dead before you cut them down and do enjoy what looks to be something that might be an insect, might be a rot, might be a spot, might be a piece of candy. It's just a part of the way that these trees grow. So if you see these interesting and sometimes weirdly colored structures on your conifers this spring, do not grab the pruners or the fungicides or the insecticides. It's the plant's way of growing and making other conifers. Very cool this year, mm -hmm. all over. All right, a little quick on pictures this time. This is a viewer who said has had these insects for years, mostly outside, occasionally come into the basement. They do spray an insecticide. Sometimes they have 25 to 30 a day. Well, these lovely little critters are not what some people will call water bugs. They are what we call oriental cockroaches. <laughs> and if, as I heard the pick question, you know, they find them outside, mm -hmm. which they're active at night, which is why they find them when they turn the porch lights on. If they are finding them inside, that means they're getting in somehow. I would check around any of your pipes entering your house, whether it be electrical or dryer vents or furnace vents or anything like that. Make sure those are sealed. Some caulking or some expanding spray foam insulation works really well for sealing up those holes and they'll help keep them out of your house. Also in areas like the kitchen uh, where those pipes and water feeds come up through the cabinetry, be sure to seal all of that off as well. So you try to keep them from moving from one area to another, especially when they're looking for in those drier times areas under the sink that tend to be a little higher in moisture. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, Henbit. We have a couple pictures of Henbit and uh, with somebody wondering whether in the world it is Henbit from Lenora, Kansas and said tenacity did not kill it. So how do you, how do you get rid of this? Well, it's a winter annual. So right now it's getting close to dying in Kansas. So there's nothing we want to do right now. If it's a continual problem from an area that's just open, Pre, any kind of the pre-emergent they use for crabgrass now will actually work in the fall when it's going to start to begin its life cycle. So next fall, you'd want to go out with that application of a pre-emergent product to uh, control the henbit. So it's not henbit though. It might be ground ivy in flower already? Really? Yes, ground ivy is in flower. So I mowed a bunch off this last weekend. Good job, Elizabeth. So Just saying. So if it could ground be ground ivy. ivy. Could be ground ivy. That looks like, like red herring. You feel like it's henbit, and then you, you, you're like <laughs> double teaming here. What is going on? So which one is it? Ground ivy, creeping Charlie, or henbit? Ground ivy. Ground ivy. My vote. I, I'd vote ground ivy too. Okay. okay. I concur. <laughs> so how do we control ground ivy? <laughs> Uh, in the later, it's, it's, we're going to do that Let's one in the fall. Let's all throw Bill under the bus tonight. Do that one in the fall. Uh, you know, products like uh, triclopyr containing mixes in three ways are better for these woody plants. And uh, Kim, you just threw me right under the bus with that one. We love you, Bill. What happens when you don't look at the pictures close enough and Kim says hiding bit on it? You go, oh, it's hen bit. <laughs> well, that's what they thought it was. You are just something else. Oh, I'm all red. Yeah. Well, they do look. Exa pretty that's, close to yeah, the same. I mean, that's the problem yeah. with it. People don't know which one they have. So, mm -hmm. ground ivy. Thanks. Perennial. <laughs> Perennial. Control in the fall. All right. Thanks. Enjoying the spring. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Lauren, we have a peach and we have an apple tree with a dead branch. The peach is in Grand Island and it's looking like that. Um, they wonder, is it a goner? What is this? And then the Harrelson apple tree has a dead branch this year also. So they're wondering, that's a little hard to see, but it looked like the whole top of the tree was fire blighted on that one. 
Yeah, so, uh, well, and, and when we have trees that have injury or damage, like the peach in, in that crotch area of the tree, you really have a weakened tree. Um, it's really gonna be difficult long-term. The tree's not gonna perform very well. So I would really take careful watch on that one. You may end up just replacing it, depending on how that progresses. Um, in this case, if you do have fire blight on the upper portion, you really need to do some pruning and some cleanup to get rid of all your dead branches to reduce your inoculum. And I'm gonna stop there because we're supposed to do it fast. Okay, so yeah, it's... And that uh, could be peach tree borer there at that point too. Could be borer at that point, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and they don't live very long in Nebraska anyway, so. Mm. All right, Elizabeth. That's a hard one. Yeah, it is. All right, Elizabeth, this is a North Platte viewer that has, um, there were a couple pictures. This is really the only one that was clear. It's a crack that goes all the way down the trunk and around the branch, and it is a red bud in North Platte. So unfortunately, um, the branch became, came off because it looks like it had included bark, which is just like a hangnail on a branch. The hard part with that crack going as deep as it is, if you're seeing sunlight through that tree, no amount of taping it or wrapping it is gonna help out. So that's gonna be an instance where I'd watch it, but I'd maybe consider removal of that tree just because as deep as that crack is going, um, it's not gonna seal over any, anytime soon. And that's pretty far west for Redbud. Yeah. It is, and, it, and I didn't look in the background if there was any concrete or reflected heat or anything around that, too. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. Well, we have a whole bunch of announcements tonight of really fun things in the gardening world. Omaha Men's Garden Club plant sale, the third and fourth in Omaha, with a couple of uh, information pieces on the screen. Our second one tonight is the May Museum 20th Annual Perennial Plant Sale, Saturday, May 4th, in Fremont. That'll be a fun one for people. Nebraska Daylily Society, the Bear Root Daylily Sale, Saturday, May 11th at Lauritsen Gardens in Omaha. The next one is Planting Time Always Garden Club Annual Plant Sale, also May 11th in Carter Lake, Iowa. So Lauritsen to Carter Lake, and you've got a lot of things to do. And I think we have one more, which is, of course, us, we are really excited to add another program to the Backyard Farmer family. Do be sure to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on our NET's Facebook page this Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Central. For that initial program, we're going to be talking about flood recovery with Nebraska Extension educators John Wilson and Kathleen Q. That's Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer, Sunday, May 5th, 6.30 p.m. Central on the Backyard Farmer or the NET Facebook page. So a chance to actually figure out whether we have hen bit or, or creeping Charlie if we dig deep, deeper next. Yeah, you know, Jody Green's <laughs> texting me right now and just said you guys all threw me under the bus. So. <laughs> Not on purpose, because it looked like hen bit to me too. We just so wanted to make side. sure that no, no, the you're totally had the right. proper you're information. Totally right. That's exactly what it is. But it's all the viewers. I think it's funny Jody texted about I guess, it. I guess we're going to have to actually let you win the lightning round the next time you're on the You should ask him one more question so he gets a chance. Uh, all right, I'm going to ask him one more question. Okay. So barnyard grass, you decided maybe it wasn't? What, how would people tell well, barnyard versus brome? Barnyard grass is a summer annual. Mm -hmm. Brome is going to be a perennial. And so that's just going to be one reason that we're not going to receive barnyard grass right now. And barnyard grass is really distinctive and, and it has, generally has a red base. And there's other distinctive features that we can identify. But I wouldn't, you know, brome versus tall fescue is a lot harder to distinguish, especially from a couple pictures. But barnyard grass is something we're going to see later on. It could be a problem, but not at this time of the year. Yeah, but haven't you also said that barnyard grass is becoming more of a problem in the state in some areas? It, it is, and if you do have barnyard grass in the summertime, um, things like uh, quinclorac that you use for crabgrass is also going to be useful to kill that summer annual. So. All right. Lauren, you get probably the last question of the evening, which is an uh, Omaha viewer that has a cottonwood planted in 1991. Now has a dark stripe running all the way down the trunk and is not leafing out very well. Okay, um, if it's wet, there's a lot of times cottonwoods get wet wood. If it's in coming out of a crotch area running down, that's probably what the dark coloration is. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not leafing out at all though, uh, it could be some sort of a canker. I, I said well, lightning early on some things. Anytime we get stripes in trees, a lot of times I think about lightning. All right, it's not lightning. I think we had several <laughs> examples of lightning today. And I think we probably <laughs> have no examples yeah. of and, lightning. And we have lightning here. Oh look, right. eight examples. <laughs>